A sleek blue thoroughbred, 30 feet long, four and a half tons, theoretically capable of 450 miles an hour, the end product of seven years of endeavor. Bluebird at least will not fail her pilot. Young chaps, well, one of them was chairman of the Bluebird Supporters Club, and he rather latched on to me and sort of said, Look, you're the last of the Mohicans, we've got to get you, your, you, you to write something about it. And so, this is that was the, the book, um, which I hope <laughs> is going to be illuminating for people. Bluebird's motors are fairly screaming as the power is piled on. 200 becomes 250, the 300 mark is passed. On past the 350, and the speed's rising towards Cobb's old record. Down the seemingly never-ending track, the speedometer needle reaches towards the 400 mile an hour mark. We did all of our aeronautics, you know, right from basics. We worked on, we built four different models, tested them, then worked us out of shape, calculated shape, that would be right. As the basic design, with the rules that we were given, I wouldn't change anything. Marker pegs on the track's edge fly past at almost one every nine seconds, even though they're a mile apart. The timing camera with the counter on the film's edge has clocked Bluebird at 403.1 miles an hour over the measured mile. The first exhilarating run's over, and at the track's southern end, Bluebird is refueled with 16 gallons, just enough for the return run. I got into Norris Brothers because my um, I'd started training as an engineer and I was working as a jig and tool design draftsman in Hove. Uh, but one of my older brothers was the compositor, the ad compositor for the local paper. And he came home one Friday evening and said, this ad is going in the paper next week. And it was a company wanting a design draftsman. Um, my application was there before the ad appeared. <laughs> and um, so they were a bit mystified by that. But the interesting thing really was that after the uh, years after the interview, in fact, about six years ago when I was talking with Ken, he said, you know, Don, the reason we chose you over the other applicants was because of the way you walked away from the interview. <laughs> so, yeah, a rather unusual thing, but I joined them as their first employee um, to uh, basically to work on the Bluebird boat, the K7 and was design draftsman on that, but also did other work for the company because, um, as you'll see possibly in the book, uh, we didn't make, the company didn't make money out of designing things for Donald Campbell. Um, and there were all sorts of other projects that we had to work on, which were quite interesting. Made life as an engineer exceedingly interesting because they were so, so very diverse. Donald Campbell, more than pleased with Bluebird performance, takes a welcome break. Yes, um, originally the car was the Campbell Norris 7. Seven being uh, a lucky number from Donald's point of view because it was K7, the number for the boat. Um, and Norris Brothers didn't, hadn't got a lot of publicity out of the boat and so it was agreed that it, this would be called the Campbell Norris 7. Unfortunately, and um, I can only guess at reasons, um, when Donald issued the first press release it was called the the CN7, not the Campbell Norris 7. Um, when I complained, uh, he said, oh, well, 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 we can't change it now. Um, the press will just get confused. And so Norris's were sidelined uh, again on all of this. It's, it was one of my big sadnesses that those two men who did more for engineering than 
most people that are famous. I mean, you think of Brunel and that, that sort of thing. Norris Brothers were way in, uh, in the advance of engineering. I mean, we designed the first automatic seat belt, the first um, micro switch with a major gap in it, the first air supported building. We rescued the two Goonhilly Downs um, big discs because they were designed by the best designer going and when they built them and tried to use them they just jammed up. <laughs> so, and um, you know they were quite, oh the well, first a concrete pump and the first go-kart is much more in your area. Um, and Mike Vandell has got a picture of that but the bugger won't let me have it. <laughs> It was the last bluebird because at that time, it was a, an in-between time. In England, you had to have a name to do this. In the States, you know, in any garage mechanic could do it. And there really wasn't anybody that came forward after Donald. And Ken had, as you'll see in the book, um, a fantastic design for a rocket-powered car, which I'm sure would have done 850, possibly more. And that was in sort of I think about 72 <laughs> or may have been even earlier so it had the drivers been around and the wheel been around I mean, it was so much cheaper to design and build something like that than something that's wheel driven but um, I, it was unfortunate that it wasn't taken on because uh, as again the data that I've, I've dug up I, I'm quite sure the car was capable of over 500 miles an hour and probably 550 uh, as a wheel driven car and so we'd be well in hand on the existing wheel record. Oh massively the, 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 the big difference was all of the internals the chassis the drive and the, uh, and the power the motive power um, the amazing thing was um, that we did all of our aeronautics you know, right from basics. We worked on, we built four different models, tested them, then worked us out of shape, calculated shape that would be right. When we'd finished that, we compared it with the Railton Mobile Special, and the outlines are almost identical, which shows that Reed Railton was a very, very intuitive man because he did very little wind tunnel testing. But the, the, the chassis was uh, way in it. I, the um, protection shell of the present Formula One car is basically what we used for that. Okay, they've got the benefit of uh, carbon fibre, which we didn't have, but it was the same construction. Um, and everything there was designed to aeronautical standards. There was no fitting. Everything was designed down to the last tenth of a thou, if you want to go that far. Um, with, yeah, everything really thought through at every stage, with nothing. We didn't look at anything that had happened before in the design. It wasn't until we designed and got what we wanted that we then looked at other, other things. So it was a very, very different vehicle. The timers and the scrutineers hold the answer to the question that's on everyone's lips. Has Donald Campbell come through with the record? It's all over, but Campbell's face reflects his disappointment. He's utterly dejected, convinced that once again he's failed to capture the record he's been trying to snatch for seven long years. In that return run, Campbell had come close to disaster. The razor-like salt crystals had torn the tread from a rear tyre. Bluebird had travelled over the last seven miles on the casing only at speeds over 400 miles an hour. And Campbell told reporters he was amazed that the tyre had stood up to such a fantastic beating. Then comes the message. 
Bluebird has been timed over the measured mile at 403.1 miles an hour, exactly the same speed clocked on the first run. Donald Campbell was now the fastest man on four wheels. A sudden hush, and in a tender scene, Campbell whispers four words to his wife, Tonya. Darling, we've made it. For the rest of the project team, defeat had been turned into victory. Seven years of sweat and struggle were over. Eight days after his triumph on the salt pans, the biggest crowd ever to pack Adelaide streets roars out its welcome to Campbell and the project team. Campbell is more relaxed than he's ever been, and Bluebird's travelling at its record slowest speed, 10 miles an hour. Adelaide's in carnival mood for the civic welcome from the Lord Mayor. In a few words, Campbell sums up the years of striving. Eighteen months on the lake might well have been condensed into two weeks had the track been right. I was, he says, very, very lucky to break the record and survive. <laughs> 